Here we are. Good evening. Um, my name is Sydney Bell, and uh, I'm really delighted to be hosting uh, this edition of um, uh, the core call Books, Bards, and Ballads. And uh, we're here this evening with uh, author Robin Korak, who I will um, introduce a little bit more in a moment. Uh, before I do that, and before we jump into our conversation, I just want to uh, say a few words um, uh, about this evening and um, to let you all know that this is an event that's a, a Sisterhood of Avalon event, uh, which you probably gathered since you are here joining us on the Sisterhood of Avalon Facebook page. Uh, we're really glad that you're, you're here with us. Um, the Sisterhood of Avalon is a, it's an international Celtic women's mystery organization. And uh, we've been around since 1995. And um, we are um, an organization that brings women together, um, seeking community, seeking spirit, seeking goddess, and committed to um, the Avalonian path. And it's a really wonderful tradition that balances uh, working towards nurturing our intuitive wisdom and uh, with scholastic achievement. So um, these events that are brought together by uh, our Coracle committee, um, the Coracle programming are, is online um, ongoing uh, programming that uh, kind of nurtures hopefully both of those aspects. And um, so this is, is where we are, and we uh, about once a month, we invite um, uh, authors and creators to meet with us and chat and broadcast on, on our Facebook page and have some interesting conversation. So, uh, and good evening, Cece, who says hello. Welcome. It's great to see uh, the, the folks who are here. So this evening we are delighted, and I am delighted, that uh, Robin Korak is here with us. Um, Robin is a uh, author of a book, a Pagan Portals book, and it is called Persephone, Practicing the Art of Personal Power. And I'm really excited to be talking to Robin about this. Um, Robin has been a member of the Sisterhood of Avalon since 2002. So she's got me beat by about four years. And um, she's currently serving on the Board of Trustees uh, as the Board Secretary. She's a very uh, dedicated and committed sister. She's also uh, spoken at quite a few conferences, including Pantheacon, Paganacon, and Ninefold Festival. And in fact, we'll be speaking at the upcoming Ninefold Festival in a week or two. Uh, she is also the CEO of a nonprofit, so a woman of many talents and, and interests. So welcome, Robin. It's wonderful to have you here. Oh, you are muted. Sorry. There you, you are. Now. Yeah, I hear you now. Yay. Yay. Okay, great. Um, yes, it's wonderful to be here. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm just very happy to be able to share more about her, Stephanie, and also um, how my Avalonian beliefs tie in. So thank you. Fabulous. Now, uh, Robin, I, I've known you for a long time. Like we've been, you know, uh, sisters together and we've been, um, you know, uh, you know, volunteering and things like that. But, you know, I've always felt like I've never had a, a chance to have a, a, a good old conversation with you. And so um, I was a little extra delighted that, oh, I get to do that. I get to finally sit down with Robin and have a conversation because I've been very curious about your work and um, uh, looking forward to hearing more about this journey that you've been on. Um, so again, I want to welcome those who are tuning in to our uh, Coracle Live Books, uh, Bards and Ballads for a conversation with uh, author Robin Korak. So Robin, your book, Persephone, Practicing the Art of Personal Power. Tell us a little bit about it. 
Sure. So let me start with just how I got connected to Persephone to begin with. Sure. Um, when I was younger, I had it, and this is in the book as well. I have a rare medical condition. And the way that that manifested when I was younger, in part, was that I was very physically fragile. And so mm -hmm. a lot of people would do, do things for me. I had to be careful about certain things. Um, and when I first heard the myth of Persephone, I think I learned it in school. And I thought, I was really intrigued because I thought, here is this goddess. She's a goddess, but she doesn't have, she doesn't feel like she has control of her life, at least in the traditional myth. Um, and I could relate to that. And it was empowering, but also at the same time, it was, it was really, um, it was empowering to see someone that, that could take control of their life if you look at the myth a little bit differently. But it was also interesting to see a goddess who in the beginning was not in control. And so that was very interesting for me. And I think for many years, I felt this presence with her. And then it kind of, as I went through different stages of my life, it would drift away and come back. Um, but the book, when I really started sitting down and working with Persephone, um, back when I started writing the book, I, I learned so much about really um, what it means to be sovereign and what that takes. And there is mm -hmm. sovereignty myth if you look at it a little bit differently if you read between the lines like we often have to do with our stories mm -hmm. um the goddesses and sisterhood of avalon and mm -hmm. so it really is a book about how to achieve that sovereignty how to uh, work through the challenges maybe some of the labels that we place on ourselves or that society has placed on ourselves and do that deep work and be able to um to do both as we do in avalon the decent and the ascent and come up um, really empowered in ourselves and taking charge of our life. Hmm. So it sounds like this, um, this goddess and this myth had a really deep resonance for you for a long time. And you made some yes. really kind of deep backward, like backward as in back in your life mm -hmm. uh, uh, connections with her. Uh, well, what what inspired you then to do all the work that it takes to understand her, understand her myth in a way that you could, uh, you know, do what's needed to to write a book about it? Sure. So, as I said, when I was when I was younger, I was more knowledgeable about the Persephone and the traditional Homeric hymn, where she is basically taken and and kind of forced into this role as queen of the underworld. But when I got older and I started to establish my own independence, I began to look at the myth a little bit differently and that always stuck with me. So the funny thing about writing this book is that this wasn't the book I started out writing. I had a completely different book oh, in mind and this happens a lot oh, um, from what I understand. <laughs> and so I had this other book in mind, but Persephone was one of the chapters in the book. And I was working with a publisher and the, the editor loved the book. But the book was a little bit too, I think, confusing for the, the committee that decides on what's going to move forward in publishing. And she's like, you know, that happened to me. Really think about what it is you want to focus on. And around mm -hmm. this time, that chapter that um, I wrote on Persephone was just really resonating with me. It really brought me back to her. And I remember I was doing a guided meditation and I was trying to kind of commune with Persephone and like, I really want to write this, this book, not the Persephone book, this other book. I really want to write this book and will you help me? And I remember this little voice in my head was saying, I'll help you write a book, but you're going to do something else first. And it just so happened that as I worked with her more, it became clearer to me that her book was the book that was going to come first. And so I really started to, to delve into the, um, the myth and really this combination of research about the myth, about the Eleusinian mysteries, about the Greek culture, and also some of my own um, UPG or universal, is it universal personal gnosis? gnosis yes. um, but just my, my own insights um, that, yeah. I, that I gained and it all came together. And then an opportunity came about through another publisher to do this book and it just all kind of fit together that way. And it's, it's amazing to me even as I, I just finished my second book, Demeter, which will hopefully be out sometime next year. Mm -hmm. And even with that book, the things that were happening in my life as the time at the time that I wrote the book, they all mm -hmm. coincided. So there's almost, I think, sometimes this universal force at work, it seems like that kind of that synchronicity that really helped to put this book together. And then I traveled to Greece as well around that time. So that would certainly support that inspiration. Yes. Yes. Network. And it, it sounds to me like you're 
um, open to what is going on around you and open to hearing how that, you know, guides or, you know, uh, how you're being guided to yes. what you want to put your sort of effort in and what your message is, which is amazing. Um, there's a question from Lori asking if your book is available on Amazon and can she get it as an audio book? That is a great question. It is available on Amazon. At this time, it's not an audio book. I would love to see it uh, translated into an audio book, but I think there might be um, something on uh, on your, if you do a Kindle version, there might be something that will read it to you. I'm not super familiar with that, but I'm looking into that. But definitely available on um, Amazon. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, you know, you, you've shared kind of what um, has brought you know what brought you to uh, focusing on on the myth of, of Persephone. Um, I'm curious a little bit about uh, what influenced your influences, I guess. Um, what has influenced you as a writer? Would you say? Yeah, uh, it's a question, but uh, it is a hard question. There's so many things. I think that um, certainly myths and stories. I've always loved myths and stories, mm -hmm. and the element of of play using our imagination. Mm -hmm. So those have definitely been inspirations. Mm -hmm. I am an avid reader. I am constantly reading. Um, so I've been, you know, the influences of other writers as well, and I think just um, life experiences. Mm -hmm. But also, um, you know, my my spirituality has had a huge impact on my writing. And I think the other thing, too, is and I think this is really um, helpful thing if you're a writer is the support of my family, both my immediate family and my parents, my sister, all of that, because writing a book is it's like <laughs> it's like giving birth. I would imagine mm -hmm. in some you know some ways it's, it's a lot of work mm -hmm. and there's times where you feel like. Um, I'm not going to be able to do this, or you feel like there's mm -hmm. imposter syndrome. And so having a group of people that really support you bringing this into the world, I think is, is a huge influence as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so important to have that, that support for sure in such, in something that is such a, such an effort. And I would imagine it takes a lot of energy and time and focus. Yeah. I'm curious, would you be um, willing to share a little bit more about, um, about kind of how your writing and your spirituality, how they're connected yeah. to one another? How do they? Sure. How do they so there's a couple of different ways. Um, with the book that I've done, and even with the newer book, Demeter, part of the book is based heavily on research. Mm -hmm. And part of the book is based on my own spiritual experiences. So a lot of trying things out, developing a relationship with that particular deity, um, mm -hmm. doing meditations. Um, I, for everything, I think one of the things I tend to do, and it's interesting because I started out my career as an English teacher. Oh, and so I was always looking at, yes, I was always looking at stories and looking for the symbolism and reading between the lines. And that has definitely been the case in my spirituality too. And I think that's one of the amazing things that... Um, being in the Sisterhood of Avalon has taught me is to not take stories at face value and to really look at the context of the culture at the time and kind of read between the lines and also doing that spiritual work um, mm -hmm. and cover so many things. And so it's a huge part of my writing process, communing with whatever deity I am writing about, applying their myths to my less, you know, to my life lessons is a huge part of my process. Mm. I love that. Applying their myths to your life lessons. So really, yeah, looking through the lens, looking at your life through the lens of their story. Yes. It sounds like, and, and so many lessons and insights that are, are possible with that, for sure. Um, so thinking about, you know, were there things that, that you learned or anything that surprised you as you were doing your research on this book? Yeah, so um, I learned a great deal. One of the things that I learned was, again, you know, most of us are brought up with the traditional Homeric hem where Persephone is out picking flowers in the field right. and Hades um, pops up and takes her and she has yes. no choice in her right. life. And, and Demeter, of course, is very angry. But what's interesting is when I went to Greece and I went to Eleusis, which is mm -hmm. where the mysteries were held, and you know, looking at all of the art, there's a lot of art um, that some of which is dated prior to to Homer's M 
that show Persephone with Hades and show Demeter with Hades and they're smiling and they're happy. And it was mm -hmm. very interesting to me to see that discrepancy and to find out that there were other tellings of the myth um, from different Greek writers that approached it very differently. So that was a little surprising to me. And it was, it was a good surprise because I always felt like the traditional interpretation of the myth was um, really more about victimization. And I thought that just right. didn't resonate with me. And so finding right. that there were alternatives was very empowering. Um, the other thing I learned that was really interesting was how the Eleusinian mysteries were conducted and just how, unless you didn't speak the Greek language or you were convicted of some sort of crime like murder, you could join the mysteries. It didn't. And so you had people who were in the slave classes next to business owners, next to politicians mm -hmm. that all underwent this experience of death and rebirth together. Right. And also were very committed to being silent about the mysteries. And it was, it was also interesting to see that the way that the agricultural cycle works in Greece, because it, the myth is, is very much interwoven with agricultural themes, um, there are plants such as the pomegranate that actually bloom and blossom in the fall. And they would look at um, their riches as being underground and, and uh, such as their crops that they had in silos. And so there was this view of the underworld that was um, that that not only, yes, it was definitely could be a scary place to be, but it was also a place full of treasure. And I found that to be very personally meaningful. Um, sorry about that. My light went off. Personally yeah, meaningful. <laughs> I think because I was talking about darkness in the underworld. I know. Maybe that was, just maybe that was little... part of it. Your own little um, yeah, I mean, just personally, the, the metaphor of that was really uh, interesting for me. Well, there, there's a lot lot there for sure. I love how you were talking about the um, sort of the, the, the reclaiming and diving a little deeper to um, kind of that surface or, um, you know, the, the story that we mostly know where Persephone is seen as, as a victim and, and, and you're realizing, wait a minute, there's, there's more to the story. There's more going on. And um, really interesting how you uh, shared how, um, you know, you discovered that these mysteries were open to, to anybody almost mm -hmm. who was, um, who was drawn to them. And so what did that what did that speak to you or why do you think that that jumped out at you? That I think because um, for one thing, it, it is similar to death. I mean, it doesn't matter what position you hold in life. If death is there for you, it's there for you. So it was interesting to have that kind of analogy, analogy there. Um, I also thought it was just interesting how in the name of spirituality, in the name of the great mysteries, people could put aside their divisions um, that were normally so, I mean, in, mm. in Greek culture, normally you would not find an esteemed writer or politician having a conversation with a, somebody that was considered a slave. And yet mm. here they were all together putting aside any kind of separation and were connected as one going through this very um, powerful and emotional process. Mm. And I just, you know, just really spoke to me about the way that we're all connected Yes. And how sometimes spirituality can really bring us all together in that way. Um, there's not, from what I found, there's not a lot of other mysteries that necessarily were, were like that. So th this was very unique. And I think the other thing, too, about the silence is not so much about it being um, elitist. It was more about, you know, and I, this has been talked about before in other pagan forums. You can't explain the mysteries. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, really convey the mysteries unless you've undergone them um so that was an interesting piece too yeah the, their power is in the is in the experience right yeah yeah for sure um yeah so before we went on air you talked about how you were um uh exploring some parallels between yes. stephanie and bladai with i'm very yes curious that um maybe for for folks who aren't too familiar a quick word about who Blodiwith is might be helpful sure so Blodiwith is of course a welsh goddess from the book that we typically work with in the in the avalonian tradition the mabinogion mm -hmm. and um she was created magically out of flowers to be to be this beautiful woman who was to be a wife for lou one of the characters in the story 
um, for various reasons. And she, at some point in the story, when Lou leaves for time, she kind of comes into her own. She mm -hmm. falls in love with someone else. And mm -hmm. she um, she and, and her lover plot to kill Lou. This is one of those examples of where you have to read between the lines sometimes in stories and not take it at face value. But ultimately, she is caught and she is transformed into um, an owl. So That's what started out as this lovely, um, I think of more flowers of being more passive became this, this huntress mm -hmm. um, and really came into her own. And so for me, when I, so when I started with the Sisterhood of Avalon, the first intensive or workshop that I went to was really focused on blood Iowa. And that was mm -hmm. a time in my life when I was actually going through a divorce and, you know, struggling with, do I choose for myself or do I choose for others, how I live my life? And so Blodaya was really spoke to me in that. Um, and I strongly connected with her. And when I started doing the work on Persephone, I realized there's so many parallels. They're definitely very different goddesses mm -hmm. and different stories, but there's many parallels. Both of them in the beginning have no say in their life. Everyone else makes choices for them about who they're going to be, what they were going to do. Um, right. So there's that parallel. But they also, by the end of the story, um, take control of their lives and begin to speak their own truth. In the case of Persephone, the way I interpret it, and the way some of the non-traditional myths go, she decides intentionally to eat the seeds that will keep her in the underworld part of the year mm -hmm. as kind of a third way of compromise. And of course, Blodiaweth chooses her own lover, which also goes back to her being a sovereignty goddess, of course, as well. But they both mm -hmm. come into their own. They both fulfill their own sovereignty. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of parallels there. The the journey that they take from the beginning of their story, where you could view them more as kind of a, a maid and a young woman into that maturity of, of womanhood mm -hmm. and independence. Um, there just seems to be a lot of parallels there with that. Mm -hmm. Yep. As you, a recurring theme or what I, what I hear strongly from you is that digging under the surface, being willing to kind of sit with a story that might be unsettling or, right. uh, or a goddess that might not be coming across in a, in a flattering light, whether it may seem like, oh, she's a adultering murderess or a uh, victim. Uh, right as as uh, Persephone is is portrayed and if yeah so what is what suggestions do you have for reading between the lines and and I might this might be an unexpected question because it just sort that's of keeps, okay you know this is a, a yeah. thing that you know I keep hearing from, it's a recurring recurring theme in your process so how do you right. do that and and how can how can we do that as we're approaching myths and and stories of goddesses do you think yeah i think it's really important to look at the context of society in the time mm -hmm. that the myth was written um for example with persephone with with homer's version that was a time in Greece when there was definitely a shift from matriarchy to patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And so women had less and less power. And that I think is reflected in how the story is told. Um, I think that's a very big piece of really taking a look at who wrote the story, when it was written. Um, mm -hmm. Most of these stories are written by men and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's definitely going to be a different perception based on how society views men and women in these stories. And so I think that's a really important part. I think also um, for me, looking at different pieces like the art, the art that I saw really informed um, some of my thoughts about the, the myth and what it really meant. And then the other thing for me is um, on the personal side, on the side there's, the, there's the academic, more research oriented side, but there's also the personal side and thinking about what resonates with you and what doesn't. And thinking about, um, you know, just your own meditations with those particular deities, your own experiences with those sitting time, spending time developing a relationship. What do you get? What is the sense that you get from that? And then the other thing that I find helpful is looking at the story from various perspectives. So, mm -hmm. for example, with Ladia with story, mm -hmm. um, we're we're seeing it from a perspective of society that says, you know, bad Ladia with you had an affair and you tried to kill your husband. Mm -hmm. What would it look like? if Flodiaweth was telling the story? Okay. What would it look like if her lover was telling the story? And so trying to get different perspectives also has been very helpful to me in that process. Wow, that, that would be a very powerful exercise in a lot mm -hmm. of 
different situations, both l looking at sort of ancient stories and myths, but even in our in our day to day yeah. current, current life uh, can be helpful. That just that advice and being willing to shift perspectives or or sit in another, uh, you know, from another person's uh, from from someone else's shoes. Um, I just saw. Uh, it's a bit of a, a divergence, so maybe I won't go down there. It's taking focus away from you because um, uh, I, I wonder a little bit. Um, let's see, where where do you think that this work has taken you, your engagement with Persephone? Um, it's, it's definitely connected me more closely to her. Mm -hmm. It's held me more accountable mm -hmm. because when you make the decision to be more sovereign, that means that you, you can't you can't hide behind that um, more of the, you know, somebody else made that decision. You are always responsible. It's empowering because then you have more um, more influence in your own life. You can take control of your own life. But it's also scary sometimes because that means you have to be accountable for every choice that you make and every way that you react. Um, for me, it's been a lot of um, shadow work, okay. which has been very, very helpful. And I can see how this work has in some ways prepared me for things that happened after I wrote the book. Um, so it's, it's really been, it's really been a look at the light and the dark mm -hmm. and the benefits of both and how I can keep that process going. I think that's one of the biggest things I took from this is that, um, and I kind of knew this already, but the light and the dark, as we talk about the Avalonian tradition, that whole you know healing cycle, mm -hmm. they both are so important. Um, mm -hmm. You can't really pick one over the other. They both have to be integrated and they're so important. And it is a process, it is a never ending process. Just like every year the season changes, Persephone goes underground to the underworld and then in spring she comes back up. We are constantly riding that cycle and constantly needing to be intentional about doing that work. And, and that's been a, that's had a huge impact on the work that I do personally. Mm -hmm. I'm just linking that back also to your wisdom around looking between the lines and just thinking that just being able to sit in that knowledge of knowing there is both light and dark, I think maybe keeps us or can encourage us from thinking too, I don't know, black and white or right. uh, which makes it makes us much more quickly cast like, uh, people or myths or goddesses in a certain, you know, space and not allowing sort of some some shades of gray and some some of that mystery to come through. I don't know if yeah. that's making any sense. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, and I think that too, you know, um, we have to remember sometimes that at least I do. I remember sometimes our deities are not perfect. And mm -hmm. I love it when the myths show more of a human side mm -hmm. of them. Because the other thing that's that's fascinating to me is as we go through the healing process ourselves and we gain wisdom and we have more experiences. I mean, the way I read the myth when I was 13 years old and the way I read it 10 years ago and the way I read it now, mm -hmm. they are constantly evolving because my perspective is changing based on my experiences. And so that to me reflects just that whole, again, that whole cycle of continuing. Um, but you're right, there, there's there's no, it, it's not as black. Nothing is as black and white as it seems. There's a lot of gray and I, I learn that every time mm -hmm. I delve into this. Mm -hmm. So your new book fo focuses on yes. Demeter, uh, Persephone's mother. Yes. Right? Um, so is that, do you have a timeline on, on that when we can be, Maybe expecting. So I I have submitted the manuscript, and so now it's a matter of the going through the process, which usually takes um, nine months to a year. So sometime next year, I don't have an exact time. What's really interesting to me about the process with that book is that mm -hmm. I had to approach things from a completely different. As we talked about perspectives, mm -hmm. um, here Demeter is the the mother of this child that she wants to protect, and so mm -hmm. it was really interesting looking at it from another side. It was. Mm -hmm. Also interesting to me, I mean, for one thing, um, Demeter brings, and most people don't think about this, I think, but Demeter brings Zeus and all the gods to their knees, um, which is a lot of power for women, particularly back yeah. then. You know, she just yeah. refuses 
to to do what they want her to do until she gets what she wants. And so that was very interesting. But I also think that I learned so much about, and this is what excites me about the Demeter book. There's so many aspects to Demeter. We think of the great mother and she's definitely that. But one of the things I learned, I, you know, you and I were talking beforehand that this year has been filled with a lot of grief and loss, losing people that, that I love mm -hmm. unexpectedly. Um, more, I think, in a short period of time than I've ever experienced. And this wasn't part of the book when I first started to write it, but I began to see how Demeter is really helpful when it comes to grief and loss and how there's so much we can learn from her in that aspect. And so mm -hmm. I just gave you a very long answer to a short question. Oh, <laughs> I apologize, no, but... that's why we're here. We want to hear what you're thinking and, mm -hmm. and what, um, what's coming down the, the, the pipe for, from you with uh, uh, what you're offering. Would you say your process was similar or different with um, your upcoming book with the, than the Persephone book? I think the process was similar typically and, and didn't plan it this way, just kind of how it happens. I start with the research um, and, and I'm I'm old school. So I write all my research on index cards. I don't know why I just that's the method that works for me. And yeah. I use pretty colored markers or fountain pens. Um, yeah. and so the research part is it's funny because I can get lost in that a little bit because I love to learn. So I did the research part. <laughs> what was different, I think, about this book in terms of the process was because and, and certainly there's other aspects to demeanor. She's a, a lawgiver. Um, she can also be very she can be an avenger in some ways. But the grief and loss portion, um, that was really hard for me to process. And so it took me a little mm -hmm. bit longer to really sit down and do the work because it was just such a such an emotional uh, piece of the work. And so I really had to with that piece of it, I had to do a lot more, I think, personal work and personal communing. Mm -hmm. um, and really just sift through my own experiences. And so that process was a little bit more emotional in some ways. Um, but other than that, I, it's pretty much follow, I follow this trend where I do that, like I said, the academic part first, and then I tie in all my spiritual and personal experiences to make right. it all come together. Right, right. I love how you're sort of exemplifying what I said earlier in terms of the, the sisterhood of Avalon, how we look to balance our intuitive wisdom right. along with sort of our scholastic pursuits mm -hmm. or, or, or research. And I've always really appreciated that yeah. um, and how one isn't elevated over the other um, and how as a community of women, we have, you know, folks who are strong scholastic researchers and folks who are strong, intuitive, and uh, um, follow an intuitive path and, and folks who have a lot of balance. And I don't know, that just seems to be a lovely yes. melting pot and that both kind of types of understanding are, are valued. Um, yeah, I would agree. That's definitely something. I think that process is definitely something that I've gotten from my experience in Sisterhood of Avalon. And what I also tend to do is I still, while I'm doing the research part, I'm still keeping a journal of mm -hmm. all the spiritual aspects. And this, again, is something that I learned from Sisterhood of Avalon. It's so validating when you keep track of your spiritual experiences and your UPG, and then you do the research and you find, oh my gosh, that's that's what I saw in my meditation. That's actually, mm -hmm. you know, that actually existed. Or you find mm -hmm. just clues that let you know you're on the right path. And so I really value that ability to balance both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's um, it can be very exciting and, and affirming. Um, have you ever had times when those when been like, oh, wait, there's wait. A, bit of a, a bit of a discord or, you know, maybe... You know, yeah. not quite jiving together. Yeah, I'm trying to think of where that happened with Persephone. I think it happened more with Demeter. Mm -hmm. um, just because um, I didn't realize when I started writing the book just how multifaceted she was. Right. And so my experience with her, my personal work with her had been more the mothering side. And sure. in some ways, I was a little intimidated by, by her because... I always resonated more with Persephone and from the, the child side. Right. And, um, you know, so so it was interesting to read more and to look at it from a different perspective and find out, okay, well, not that that invalidates my experiences with her, but it broadened uh, my ability to really get to know her, the fact that there was that discord. Right. Which I think that used us, yeah, to, to look beyond sometimes. Right. 
Great. Yeah, inviting different perspectives, right? Again, just op opening up. Wow, that's that's fascinating. Um, let's see here. We have a couple of. Uh, well, you know what? There's a couple of other questions here, but I am remembering that you had suggested maybe you could take us through a meditation. Sure. What do you think yeah. about that? I would be happy to do that. Um, I did. This is a meditation from the book. It's called Laying Your Labels to Rest. And there's one that is more for the dark half of the year, and there's one more for the light half of the year. And since we're um, starting to enter the dark half of the year, I have the one that is really the work of, it's just like gardening. You know, you pull out the weeds and then you get the ready ground ready to uh, grow and then you plant mm -hmm. the seeds. This one is more pulling out the weeds. And I, what really dawned on me when I worked with Persephone is that we a lot of times take on these roles or labels without ever really thinking about it. Um, someone says, oh, you're good at this. You should be this. Or society mm -hmm. just tells us, particularly as women, who, who we are, who we should be. And it doesn't necessarily align with what we want or what's true for us. And we also do this to ourselves. I think right. we didn't, we can be very judgmental about ourselves. And so this particular um, meditation gives us an opportunity. I mean, cause even good labels can be troublesome. I remember my stepson, um, he went to Hawaii for summer and worked in his aunt's bookkeeping business. And they said, you know, you're so good at accounting. And so everyone told him this and he, he went to school for accounting and he hated it. I mean, he was good at it, but he hated it, but he had that, people told him he was right. good at it. Even good labels can be challenging sometimes. So this meditation really helps to get to the heart of what those labels are and to release them. So um, I'd be happy to go ahead and start now if people want to. Yes, please do. So I invite everybody to get a little comfy for yes, a moment. Yes, get comfortable. Okay. Um, comfortable position and close your eyes. Okay. And pay close attention to your breathing. Breathe in and out slowly for a few cycles until you're ready to begin. And in your mind's eye, you see a door in front of you. This could be any type of door. It could be a large wooden door, a glass door, even a portal. So once you see the door in front of you, step through the door. You notice that it is twilight and the land around you seems cold and barren. There are marble structures, some are intact, some are not, all over this land. You pull your dark cloak around you as you shiver. Ahead, you see what appears to be the mouth of a cave and a beautiful young woman standing a few feet away. You make your way towards the cave and the woman greets you. Despite her beauty and her youthful appearance, her voice conveys maturity, self-assuredness and strength. She takes your hand and begins to tell you more about the cave. I am Persephone, queen of the underworld. This cave is the entrance to the underworld, the place where souls must begin their journey to the afterlife. Although you are still very much alive, you will be undertaking a similar journey of death and rebirth. By descending into the darkness below, you will release those aspects of yourself which no longer align with your truth and which serve only to burden you as you strive for happiness and fulfillment of your potential. Throughout our lives, we allow others to define us. We may strive to nurture and please others in order to fulfill their vision of us. If we do so without consciously considering whether or not these definitions are truly accurate, we end up sacrificing ourselves. We become stagnant, frozen, forever poised on the precipice of our own potential and power. Inside the cave, you will see that there is a staircase leading down deep into the bowels of the earth. This staircase is lit only by torches, but I assure you that you will be able to find your way despite the dim light. As you make your way down this staircase, I ask that you travel deep within yourself as well. I ask that you identify the many parts which you feel compelled to play, the labels you wear which are imposed upon you by others, society, or even yourself. Dwell within each of them, explore them, feel the weight of them, just as you have inhabited their energy in your day-to-day -day life. I implore you to think about how these labels have held you back from realizing your personal power and 
perhaps how they have dishonored and shamed you or caused you pain. Should you choose to undertake this journey, I assure you I'll be waiting for you once you complete your descent. Although I, would not, I will not be there in person to guide you, I will be there beside you in spirit. Persephone pauses and then asks if you are ready to undertake this journey. You're not sure if you're strong enough to do this, but you know you have to try. You brace yourself for what lies ahead and nod to indicate that you are ready. Persephone leads you to the top of the stairway. You can see that the stairs spiral down, at times weaving in and out of what appear to be open rooms or tunnels. You realize that you cannot see where the staircase ends. Calling upon all of your courage, you take a deep breath and place your foot on the first step. As you descend the stairs, you begin thinking of the labels that you have worn throughout your life, as well as the labels that you are still carrying around. These simple labels and expectations others have used to define who you are and or who you should be as a mother, a woman, a man, an employee, a partner, or a friend. As you name each label and consider its meanings and implications, you feel increasing pressure as though your cloak has been weighted down. While you cannot see them, you sense ghost-like creatures hovering behind you. From time to time, they whisper in your ear, trying to convince you that the labels are accurate. You continue your introspection and find that identifying the labels and what they mean to you is becoming more difficult and intimidating. With the naming of each label or expectation, the pressure on your cloak feels more and more daunting and the whispers of the ghosts become louder and louder. The light becomes dimmer, yet you manage to continue to make your way down the steps. The cloak becomes heavier, and just when you think you can't move one more step, you see Persephone's face and realize that you've reached the bottom of the staircase. Persephone smiles and embraces you. The air smells dank, and you hear the gentle lapping of water. You follow Persephone over to a river. You look down, and you're startled by your own reflection. You don't recognize the woman staring back at you as she is hunched over and burdened by an enormous dark shadowy cloak that coils around her. The cloak threatens to suffocate you and you feel paralyzed. You realize that the heavy energy you've been carrying around is a culmination of every label or belief you have allowed to be placed upon you. These labels have worn you down in ways you hadn't before realized chaining you to the shadows that lurk within and stunting your ability to see clearly. You look up and notice a dark figure in a boat coming towards you. Persephone tells you that in order for rebirth to occur, there must be a death, a release. She tells you that in order to cross back into the light, you must offer payment to the guide navigating the ferry. Test that you have nothing to give. Persephone looks deep into your eyes and places her hands on your cloak. You realize that in order to claim your power and gain your freedom, you must let go of that which has burdened you. Your ardent desire to remove your cloak causes the ghosts that have been circling around you to shriek in protest. Despite their cries and despite the weight that you have been carrying, you manage to remove the cloak and you hand it to the man in the boat. Well done, my child, Persephone says as she embraces you once more. Your journey took great courage and you will find that though others may feel challenged by your decision to shed those labels that did not align with who you know yourself to be, the reward will ultimately be as great as the journey has been daunting. Persephone assures you that she will be here for you and waiting should you ever need her guidance or feel the need to once again shed your skin and be resurrected in authenticity. You thank Persephone and you step into the boat. The boat seems to move forward of its own accord 
And while it seems to move slowly, you reach the other side as if no time has passed. The guide silently steps out of the boat and motions for you to follow him. He makes his way to a room with a blazing fire. As though it is a funeral pyre, he lays the cloak to rest in the flames, and you feel conflicting emotions as you watch the labels carried by the cloak that once seemed such an integral part of you turn to smoke and ash. When the fire has subsided and there is no more evidence of the cloak, the guide points you towards an uphill path leading out of the cave, and you understand that you are, that you are to make your way up the path and you are able to do so. With each, each step upwards, you feel lighter and lighter as though you were weightless. Joy surges through you and you feel a freedom unlike anything you have felt since you were a child. When you finally reach the top of the hill, you walk into a clearing in the full light of day. Flowers are blooming and the trees are alive with lush green foliage. You see a stream in the distance and you run towards it. As you bend down to take a drink, you see yourself. You are beautiful and glowing as if lit from within. Once you have had a chance to refresh yourself, you stand and make your way towards a door that appears in the distance. It is the same door that you encountered at the beginning of this meditation. When you are ready, you walk back through the door. Take a few moments to return your attention to your breathing. And when you are feeling grounded, open your eyes. I guess I better come back and finish. <laughs> Um, whoa, thank you so much. Sure. For that. Um, wow, I have to say that cloak that was one of the most, yeah. it felt so heavy, and um, yeah, one of the most sort of real physical sensations I've had in that kind of exercise, yeah. And then the feeling of lightness taking it off was so powerful. So, um, yes, and I also found my reflections very interesting. Like the mm. first one, you know, my hair was just like, <laughs> you know, on all ends. And then, you know, the second yeah. one, was sort of, you know, down and smooth. And yeah, mm. Yeah. That was a really wonderful, powerful experience. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's one that I find that I have to do um, each year, at least if not multiple times each year, because I think it's so easy for us to get those, have those labels kind of glom on us mm -hmm. and not realize it. And so just it's like a constant process of, of letting go. And, and mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, when I've done it, it feels so good um, to let that cloak go. And somebody asked if the meditation is in the book. And yes, it is in the book. Fabulous. Um, and I, I guess what's sticking with me too is the invitation to carefully consider the labels. Yes. Um, and I think there's more work to be done there yeah. for sure. So um, I know that I am going to uh, make that a goal of mine to engage with this this work again and, and carefully consider, consider those. Um, so yes, thank you. That uh, um, much, much, much appreciated, and 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 you're getting some comments there in the yes. in the chat. How powerful! So, oh, I'm so glad we're all sitting here in, in gratitude. <laughs> well, thank so, you. Um, I guess in in wrapping up before I, you know, share some of the other upcoming Coracle events. Could you just remind us again? So you're so this book that's available now. Remind mm -hmm. us the name, and do, do you have a copy of it there? Oh, that beautiful. Yes. So Persephone practicing the art of personal power. Um, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, pretty much any major book retailer, and through Moon Books as well. And that's where you should be able to find Demeter when it comes out, and I'll let people know. Um, you also connect with me. I, I can I write a blog on Agora Papios called Phoenix Rising. That comes out about once a month. And I also have a website, um, www.phoenixawenrising.com. 
But if you're a member of the Sisterhood of Avalon, you can connect with me on the aisle or you can always connect with me on Facebook as well. Fabulous. So that was Phoenix Alwyn Rising. Yes. Dot com. Wonderful. Um, and uh, let's see. And are you you're speaking at the Ninefold Festival? Yes. Thank you for so, reminding me. Yeah, yeah. So I'm talking at Ninefold about, um, and then this kind of goes back to my experiences with grief and loss. But given the theme of Ninefold, I'm talking about how uh, my personal experiences in working with Avalonian goddesses and how they've each taught me something different as it relates mm -hmm. to that and just kind of sharing that. And I will have a guided meditation as part of that too. Um, I think okay. with Caridwin working with. So yeah, I'm very excited about that. And anybody who's listening, I really encourage you to go Ninefold. The speakers are I mean, amazing. The keynote speaker, Jenna, every year mm -hmm. just blows me away and all mm -hmm. the speakers that we've had. So um, mm -hmm. very good use of time I found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh we learn lots yeah. and we have an opportunity to be in uh, in community. And uh, so you can certainly find out information about that on our Facebook page here. Um, I see there's, you know, lots of wonderful uh, um, prom uh, promo ads. So check that out. And um, also uh, the Coracle is hosting an upcoming uh, Women in Druidry event on November 6th and so I, I don't believe that registration is open for that yet um, but keep you know save that date and keep checking back here on our page uh, for information about that when that is available. Uh, I see uh, Morgane has shared that a signed copy of Persephone will be available in the artisan auction at Ninefold that you've donated Robin. So that's yes. That is fabulous, fabulous. Wonderful. Well, Robin, I've enjoyed our time together so much and um, uh, I've learned a lot and I'm excited about, um, I think, developing more of a relationship with Persephone. What, what a gift that you've offered to us. Thank you. Um, so is there any final thoughts or comments you wanted to make before we sign off? I think just again, really appreciate um, being here. And, you know, some while we're talking about a Greek goddess, so much of what I've learned and through this process has also come from my time in Sisterhood of Avalon. So I really encourage um, people to, to take a look at the Sisterhood of Avalon in general, also. But thank you for having me here. I'm glad that the meditation, it seems like it resonated with so many of you. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear that. So thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Robin, and thank you to those who have joined us and uh, engaged with us. It was great to have you here. Uh, you know what? I'm embarrassed to admit I don't know who's coming up next in our Coracle Live. Uh, Morgane, I know that you're here if you're still here. Um, do you know who our next author is? I, I didn't have that handy. Um, it, oh, good. My friend Tiffany Lazic, you don't want to miss that in October. Um, so, uh, of course, check out our page. Uh, that's sure to be uh, an interesting, informative, and entertaining uh, time with Tiffany. So, uh, again, thank you, Robin. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope everybody has a lovely rest of the evening and a fabulous weekend. And uh, hopefully we'll see many of you at Ninefold, right? Take care and good night. Good night.